We're going to get started again. If, we, if everyone could take their seats, we're going to get started again. I want to try and keep us on track, uh, mo get back on track this morning. Um, for those who are tuning in live um, to the virtual presentation, we've uh, gotten our technical difficulty um, uh, sorted out, and so you should now be able to see the slides, <laughs> sorry, along with the streaming. Um, of the presentations. And um, so I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dan Feinberg, to introduce um, the next presentation. Dan. Thank you, Alex. I'm very pleased to introduce my colleagues from Empire State and Buffalo State College, some of our true leaders across system in online learning and specifically in the accessibility new deal. I've learned almost everything I know about it from them. And they've impacted our practices. I'm proud to say that our accessibility rubric, the PDF, is now itself accessible, thanks to uh, their efforts and knowledge that they have uh, provided me. So here is Empire State and Buffalo State. Megan. Thanks, Dan. Um, and one of the things that we asked Dan before this, we said this is going to be closed captioned, correct? And <laughs> And he said, yeah, after, we'll get that taken care of for you. So it's, it's really something that I think we, um, we think about in regards to accessibility and universal design, but it's the, you know, how do we make it happen? You have a person. And there are automatic tools that will do it that you can then go in and edit. So it really is something that, you know, we always think of sometimes after the fact, and I think that this is something that hopefully during our presentation, um, we can start to encourage you to start thinking about things um, at the forefront um, to ensure that everyone who is joining us in the room, everyone who is joining us virtually, um, has the full um, experience. And that's really what um, we try and do. So again, um, my name is Megan Pereira, Senior Instructional Designer from Buffalo State College. Um, and with me, we have Kathleen Stone from Empire State, uh, Ginger Bedell from Buffalo State as an Instructional Designer, um, and Sumana Silverheels from Buffalo State in our Disability Services Office. Um, so in regards to campus perspective, um, where we're coming with this, and as we continue to work uh, through this presentation, we encourage you to answer these questions with us. Ellen Seide, um has a microphone, so if there's something that you want to add or say during the presentation, um, please raise your hand and let us know. We want to make this more of a conversation um, uh, within regards to keeping it on time. Also, we'll, um, we'll do that. But, um, you know, Buffalo State is a four-year comprehensive college. We have face-to-face, -face, hybrid. Um, and online courses. So when we're talking about accessibility, we are also talking about those face-to-face -face classrooms that we have. Um, and looking at and having the closed caption on while you are in the classroom showing a video. So that's kind of the things that, that we have to think about. Um, we, um, and Sumana has shared that we have about 500 students that go through um, our disability services office. But one of the things that we want you to also think about is that not every student discloses their disability. There are adaptive and assistive technologies that students have that they don't need to contact Disability Services Office. Um, so we need to ensure that all of our content is accessible from the start so that students may not really even have to contact Disability Services Office, that they can come in, there are no barriers, and they can work through the course that we develop without contacting Disability Services. There are always accommodations where they do need to contact them, um, but that's where we want to be sure that it's really not about the number of students that disclose through Disability Services, because they're not required to do that. They don't have to do that if they don't feel comfortable doing that. So, as we go through, think about that we want to make sure that everything is accessible regardless of the number of people that disclose in our Disability Services Office. Hey, so at Empire State College, I work in our Center for Distance Learning. We're a very large college. We have regional centers throughout the state. So when I'm talking, I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of the Center for Distance Learning, although we have people all across the college working on accessibility as well. 
Um, we have about almost 500 fully online master courses. And so that's, that's my uh, perspective is how we handle those master versions and how we work on those to make sure that they're accessible for all learners. And then of those, we have over 2,000 sections that will run throughout the year of those courses. So in large program, we have uh, an adult population, which is important to note. Most of our students average about age uh, 36, starting to trend a tiny bit lower, 34, 35. But these are you know, busy working adults. And 500 seems to be a magic number, because we also have about 500 uh, students that go through our disability services office. So whenever they want to talk about laws and all this fun, wordy stuff, they say, hey, Disability Services Office, can you talk about that? Well, it's not always about the laws. The laws are there. They are for us to follow. We know what the ADA is. We know what Title II is, the Rehab Act. You know, we've been through that many, many times. What we are trying to say is we want to be, have our students learn. We want to be able to teach. And the way we teach, we need access for all our students. So regardless of what laws are making us do this, we need to do this because we want to do it. And as Megan said, you know, we have, we have 500 students, but there are many, many more that do not go through our office. So to be able to put that content out there, and when we look at it, for me, and in the, um, being in, on campus, I think of students walking in, and getting our services, but we are seeing more and more online education. Tests are being taken online. They're hybrid. So even if they have, they meet once a week, they still have courses and information that they have to access online. So our LMS system has to be accessible. But the LMSs are not always the issue. It is what content gets put on it. So we are really working hard to educate our faculty and um, staff, and it's not just the educational instruction material, but all college information, admissions and uh, financial aid and anything that a student deals with as an online student, it all needs to be accessible. And we all need to follow those guidelines. So those laws seem to keep popping up in the news. Um, just recently, um, there was the Harvard and MIT lawsuit um, in regards to captioning. Um, so we're, we're continuously seeing, um, you know, situations in regards to accessibility in the law. If any of you checked out the Chronicle this morning, um, there is an article right in the technology section this morning um, about high-tech programs are causing barriers for students with disabilities. And so in regards to online, in regards to, you know, using pieces from TOPE, we're all doing that every day. But how do we make it so that these high-tech courses that we are developing are accessible. So um, again, the laws and you know, the things that happen in the news, um, we just need to be aware of and figure out how on our campuses are we going to respond. And that's kind of where um, hopefully you will leave today with um, thinking about what your action plan will be on your campus if you don't have one yet. So students, when they disclose uh, a certain kind of disability or come to our office uh, saying that, you know, I, need, I have this paperwork and this is my supportive disability and what can you give us, help us be successful in college, we have, you know, identified barriers. And this is common in most colleges, you know, testing accommodation. So you extend your time on testing, distraction-reduced environment, books in alternate formats. These are all common um, issues that come up. Every now and then we'll have hearing impaired students and we'll have to spend quite a bit of money on doing interpreter services or card services where they come in and they have to do live um, interpretation. So if we didn't have anybody here, we didn't actually think about having somebody do an interpretation here. So if we, this was supposed to be like public, we would have somebody doing a sign language interpretation right at this moment, live. So, you know, those kinds of things have to be taught. And that is something they have to disclose to us. So if they need those services, they have to disclose it to us. And we have to provide those services. But those are barriers that we have to look at for online students. Because this is, again, I have to keep thinking and going back to we're talking about online teaching. 
So when we are doing online teaching, we don't know who's registering for those classes, what kind of difficulties they have accessing, are they, you know, do they have bimodal learning, do they like that speech output, do they use speech input, everything that we put in there, are they able to access every information that is, uh, that any regular student without a disability, which I would say is rare because we all have something going on that allows us, or we are all different learners. We learn, some learn by doing, some learn by reading, some learn by listening. So it's all different kinds of learning. And as, you know, Ginger will talk about UDL, those are the things that we are going to work on is making the content, especially online, more engaging and more so that we can reach that population. Just not thinking just disability, but just multi-learners, multimodal learning is what. So barriers of learning are, and, and it could be as simple as, uh, you know, seating when it's, com when it's um, in, on campus. And when we were talking this morning and, um, you know, Megan said, what do you mean by seating? Well, somebody might not want armed chairs. They might not be able to fit in an armed chair. So we have to have chairs that, and tables and desks put into classrooms. So those are some barriers that we face when we are in, on campus. So online, we have to think of, again, the instruction, the materials. Uh, it does, is the student at the other end, does he have to stand and work on that computer while they're doing things? So those, you know, just keeping an open mind about the information. So I don't know where Ellen went. Um, <laughs> There she is. Um, what other barriers, kind of, you know, if people have other, what other barriers are you finding um, on your campus in regards to, you know, students um, that could be related to disabilities that you feel as though you need some assistance in supporting those students? So, um, I know Maureen. We've had uh, students and actually some staff members that have color blindness, which faculty are not aware of. So some of them love being able to use different icons and colors. And, and so we have to tell them you, you can't really do that. Um, and luckily, these students and staff members have, have self-identified. But it's something that you don't always think of. Which is why our slides are very plain. <laughs> you know, purposely done in regards to being sure with accessibility. Um, people in the back, and again, it's the dis whether it's disability or not, somebody in the back may not be able to see the contrast. Thinking about the audience that you are presenting to. You always have to have that in mind. Um, any other barriers? Up, up. Nobody usually has trouble hearing me. We recently had a faculty member who... Um, thank goodness felt comfortable enough to say I've recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's and I'm having trouble with keyboard and I said well you know they make bigger keyboards with big buttons and why don't you talk to either the office accommodation or see who can come up with something and we did it yeah. many of us um, in the room provide training so we also have to think as we are providing training for our faculty not also, you know, our, not just our students, but the faculty that we train. And, and that's, you know, alternate input devices too, like keyboard, mouse, trackball, speech input, just, you know, different difficulties. Things that we're having problems with is the third party content for the publishers. And a lot of them provide video, but they're not closed captioning before they provide it. And that is a huge thing for our campuses. The content uh, creator, again, is responsible. So it would be the more voices they hear, the more the publishers hear that they need those content closed caption, that's going to help our cause. Uh, my last university was all ESL students. And so the captions on the videos are using Dragon Dictation to capture lectures. I think we forget how many people in the U.S. are second language learners, and this isn't just about disability, it's about people who can walk away and get more out of their learning because English isn't their first language. It's access more than anything, it's access for everybody. Um, at our college, one of our, we're from Delhi, uh, Michelle and I, and um, one of the things that I've found that our one of our biggest challenges is trying to figure out what the closed captioning, who is going to do that, because that's a lot of work to do. 
and the faculty feel like that's a, a lot to work to put on them, our disability office is trying to push it off on the online education staff, um, and we can't support all of that. Uh, so basically, it comes down to who's actually going to do it and how we're going to pay for it. So if you guys have any ideas for, about yeah. that, that would be great. Um, our next slide right here, and I think I just saw Maureen's, but we're going to talk about the responsibility. Whose responsibility is it is actually the next slide. So I know Maureen has a, a comment slash question, and then we will definitely address that because it's very common. We just had a meeting yesterday, actually, with our uh, advising staff because they've done a bunch of videos for the students on the college's main website. So we met with a company because they have to be captioned. Um, and we're looking at this. The cost is, is kind of high, uh, about $3 a minute to have a company do it, but you can set it up automated through Ensemble. Um, but there's, there's a lot to it. We could type it ourselves, and you have to set it up a certain way. Then it's $1.15 a minute, but there's, there's a lot to this. But we're, we're all looking at the same thing at the same time. So I think this is very timely. So, okay. so uh, whose responsibility is it? What do you think I'm going to say? Everybody. Everybody's. And it truly is. Um, you, you have people creating the content. You have people helping those creating the content. Uh, so at Empire, it's, you know, the instructional designers do a lot of this work, but we're not the only ones. It takes student services to be able to work with these students. It takes our disability services office, um, our educational technology office. When they're looking for uh, new um, emerging technologies for us, they need to be requesting a VPAT, which they're doing. Um, and if nobody's familiar with that, it's the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. It basically is a form that, they, that a, a company can complete that tells you if their product is meeting Section 508 standards. So that should be happening with every product that you are looking to implement in, on your campus. So every single office has to have some involvement in this, which, you know, to get that to happen, it really helpful if somebody at the top is supportive and it believes in this and is sending that message down through the institution. Plans need to be created. How are you going to handle this? Like for something such, you know, captioning is a great example. There has to be a plan set up that says if you need captioning, this is what you're going to do. And for us, we use all, all sorts of different um, processes depending on the situation. We will send some stuff out. We'll do some of it ourselves. Um, it really just depends on the situation, how much, how much uh, that content needs to be captioned. Uh, so everybody is responsible. I agree. Uh, Buffalo State, um, we don't have master courses, so our faculty members are creating their courses. And so if they're creating content, it's their responsibility to make sure that they're creating content that's accessible. However, a lot of faculty members don't know how to do that. So that's where the instructional designers um, and faculty development center come in, we do trainings um, to help to um, help faculty members make accessible Word documents, make accessible PowerPoint presentations, make sure that they're using PDFs and other types of files that are accessible. Uh, we do workshops on creating accessible audio and video. Um, so we support them and help them do that. We do have a plan for captioning at our campus. What we do is uh, we use Ensemble, which is a, a video and a media server and faculty members upload their content into Ensemble and then they need to let us know, let me know, that they've uploaded something into their media library that needs to be, that they're going to be sharing with their students. And then we have um, an integration with AutoSync technologies and so then I submit for captioning and the captions you know, appear a couple days later in Ensemble. And it is about $159 per hour of video. Um, but it's something that you know, we're committed to and um, so that's, you know, that's, that's our plan. But faculty members who are building courses, they don't always use all the content that they've created. They also use a lot of content from other sources. And it's important for them to know that that, that content needs to be accessible too. So even if they didn't create it, if they're using a YouTube video, they're using a TED-Ed video, um, they're using a website, all of that needs to be accessible too. And it's not always. Um, so you have to be picky when you're, when you're selecting things to use in your course. You can on YouTube do a search. You can um, you know, filter your search for only closed captioned videos. And then some of those videos are auto-captioned, so you need to make sure that you're viewing the videos with the captions on to make sure that the captions are accurate because they're not 
almost ever. And sometimes they're, <laughs> they're embarrassing and really bad. Um, you know, we just had, uh, we wanted to use a TED video in our MOOC and, you know, the captions weren't good, so we didn't use it. And, you know, it's, it's a shame because it's not there, but we didn't want to, you know, have that barrier um, in our MOOC. Um, and one more thing is that at Buffalo State, um, like Sumata mentioned, we really advocate for, um, we do workshops on universal design for learning and we really advocate um, f for our faculty members to um, use the principles of universal design for learning to remove barriers, you know, to design their courses without barriers. So putting everything in proactively in, a, in an accessible format so that if they do, you know, first of all, for students who don't identify, the content is accessible. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, we've had situations where a student does identify, you know, and it's, you know, the week before the course start starts, the course is already built, and now the faculty member has to scramble, and the Disability Services Office has to scramble to try to make everything accessible, which is really difficult. So, you know, we try to build it that way. I just want to add one thing about YouTube videos. Um, one thing that we also encourage is that if you find a YouTube video that you really want to use, if there's no captions on it, see if it's Creative Commons licensed for us, because if it is, then, and if it's licensed in a way that we can then take that video, we can then add the captions ourselves, we can download it, we can do things with it. So that's one of the things that we encourage our faculty to do is to make sure that, you know, if there's, if there's not captions, then make sure it's Creative Commons licensed so that we can take care of that. Yes, Jennifer, go ahead. Um, just curious, I do a lot of accessibility, I'm interested in accessibility quite a lot, but it has occurred to me every once in a while um, what will I do when I have uh, an online course that's in a different language? Um, are we legally responsible for also providing the accessibility options for that? And um, if you've dealt with that, I mean, you can't just send out to a service for Arabic, for example. Um, when you are, when you say you're doing something online in a different language, are you putting out videos? I mean, it depends on the content. Okay, so um, language is definitely a challenge. So language teaching, books, language books, Spanish has been a great challenge for us, for students with visual impairments. Now, um, being on campus, it was a little bit of a different approach. We were able to have, now if you're showing a video, it was mostly for testing. There were audio files that had, they had to listen and answer to. Now for captioning purposes, if they are videos and they need to be captioned in Arabic, uh, I don't know how to do it, but <laughs> but um, there are there are uh, you know um, auto sync technologies actually f sends out feelers every so often and says how many of you can do language captioning and if that is something that you are skilled in then they will approach those transcribers to do those transcriptions in that language. Uh, I do have some experience with Spanish, not so much with any other language, and Spanish is more common uh, in the U.S. for us to be able to make accessible, but it was, it was quite a bit of a challenge to do that. We spoke with yesterday, mm -hmm. and they showed us that now in their drop-down, you just choose the language that you want, so yeah. the, and they did have Arabic. They had quite yeah. a few, yeah. um, so they said if it's another language, and of course the turnaround might be a little bit longer, but um, so that yeah, it is they are. More they available. are expanding. Thank you. Thank you for that information because they are expanding. Yes. 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 The laws are there. Um, so, so the question, um, just for those um, virtually, if you didn't hear it, um, the question, and correct me if um, I make a mistake, um, what is, um, what's the best plan in regards to the, the percentage of accessibility that, that we should have for our courses, or what would our goal be? Um, so what we are doing at Buffalo State um, is, as faculty are coming um, to us now, any new courses will be fully accessible. Um, those faculty, as they're coming in and developing a course um, online, 
if they have other courses that that they are working on we ask them at that time to go through um, that course so we're actually taking out one faculty member at a time um, that you know whoever comes to our training um, you know one of the things that Kathleen mentioned was you know in regards to course reviews so Buffalo State does not currently have the process of a course review uh, before a course is actually taught so for the training purposes that's where we really can you know capitalize on getting our faculty to understand um, and move these things forward um, so that's kind of where we are we're, we're reaching out to faculty as they're developing new courses um, as they're coming to training and then going back to the courses that we know have videos that may not have been captioned and, and then going back so anything from here on out um, we try and make fully accessible um, you know, the other thing too, just to kind of answer the question in regards to captioning and, you know, the price of captioning and things like that, um, we have just been really lucky on our campus that our CIO and our technology governance has said, this is the law, this is what we are doing. So if something needs to be captioned, we're going to caption it. Um, we have a video production staff um, also at Buffalo State. And so when our faculty come down and work with our video production, um, they're asked to bring a script so that we can take that script and then create the captioning. So again, it really is the process of what you are doing on your campus and how in all of those different avenues you can work together to make things accessible. Um, so what responsibilities, if any, do we have in regards to student submissions? So if a student is doing a project that's to be shared out with the rest of the class uh, in a video format, do we have any expectations or obligations with regards to that? All right, I guess I, I can take this one. Um, so if there is a peer, so one of the ways that we've looked at this is that if there is a peer review, so if there will be the opportunity for a peer review, then you will want to be sure that it's accessible. Um, you, the instructor can make that decision in regards to knowing who their students are in the class. Again, some students don't disclose, so in regards to online. Um, so from a peer review perspective, if the students that are submitting videos or submitting assignments, they should be done accessibly if there is going to be a peer review process. And you don't have to think about um, having it going out and spending $159 per hour of audio for the students. There are other simpler f ways to do things. So those are the alternatives that you have to think of. And we have the best practices um, on our website at, uh, in, in how to get those resources, how to have students have that mindset that things have to be accessible. Yeah, and one of the tools that I know that a lot of faculty like to use is VoiceThread, and, which is wonderful as far as it's got uh, an accessible version for screen readers, but if you're a student who's ha his, who is hearing impaired and everybody's leaving a voice comment, that's going to be problematic. So I like to encourage our faculty to have people do both. I know it's not the, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose in, in some <laughs> essence, but it's really important if you're leaving a voice comment that there should be some kind of a transcript comment, you know, something text-based to go with it. And, and that's, again, it's, it's going to help everybody. So not everybody wants to listen to something. They might prefer to read it. So having those options is important. The, the other thing I wanted to talk about is how we're approaching the next question, how's your campus ensuring that federal guidelines are met? And this kind of goes with the question earlier about, you know, process and how do you do this. And so we, you know, at Empire State College in the Center for Distance Learning, we, we are, um, because we have master courses, we're able to go through those master courses as part of our regular revision process. So I have a, um, my, my team is um, a curriculum instructional designers, and we have almost 500 master courses. And we already have a cycle that we go through these courses for. It's kind of, that's what we do in my department. So we, we revise about 150 courses a year. Um, that's a major revision. We have another 130 that go through a minor revision process and about 20 or so new developments every year. And so what we're doing is I have a rubric which we will share at the end that I've created for my instructional designers to use. And they, every time a course is revised, they apply that rubric, the accessibility rubric, as well as our design rubric. And so going through that process is what's going to make us get to the point where all of our courses are fully 
accessible and gone through this. So if we're, it, this retro, going back and retrofitting, so to speak, courses is the most challenging part. So if there's a video that's not captioned, where it's going through revision, we're gonna make sure that we get that captioned. Um, we run into copyright issues, so sometimes we have to deal with that. Um, but you know, I think it's, uh, it, the, the big point is that you need to have some kind of a plan on your campus that will work for how your business is, how, you, how your pro business processes run, right? So if we are, um, you know, if, if we're in a different center or if you're at Buffalo State, you know, you might have to do it where you're working one-on-one -on -one with a faculty and then the faculty might have to do a lot more work on that themselves. Um, one thing I also want to mention, because I know Ginger had said something about this, our faculty work on our master courses. I think that's a common misconception. Every, we, instructional designers don't do this alone and faculty don't do this alone. So every time a course is revised or every time we have a new course being developed, it's always a faculty member and an instructional designer working side by side. So in that regards, our faculty are lucky because they have somebody to help them with this process. Um, but you know, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Megan or Ginger to talk about the process. We actually have two questions, so we can take those right now and then Ginger can. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanna commend um, you know, the models that you put forward are really great. And um, sometimes though, I think faculty and schools have difficulty with some of those fees involved with the professional transcriptions. So that's why I, in tools of engagement, accessibility is a common thread in a lot of the conversations. And it's a, a, um, a section that's linked to from every page in the site. And there's information and we discuss how can faculty do some of the auto caption features of Google, but then go in and edit them so that they are more accurate. And then we also talk about how you can, yeah, and we use this feature a lot on our campuses to get federally funded work study students to do, learn that very simple, low threshold technology um, task of captioning um, the videos. And there's also been some tools that have been suggested that I can go find them on how you can caption other people's videos and, and it, it, or at least a minimally provide the transcripts if it's something that's really good. Um, I think I can speak loud enough. Oh, okay. um, from from your experience, I don't have much experience with modifications and the kinds of and the kinds of access issues. But is this something that has an economy of scale? Is this something that SUNY could build for all of us in one place, or is it not going to work that way? Um, so in regards to SUNY, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing in regards to accessibility is the content that faculty is creating. So, so right there, it's really on your campus ensuring that the content that faculty are creating is accessible. So we know in regards to, you know, as the campus is purchasing, you know, Blackboard or Moodle, you know, that that evaluation, whether it's at the campus level or the system level, you know, that's where they can, you know, system and your campus can help you in regards to the, the products that, that they and the technology that they're you know asking or, or sharing with us to use on our campus. So from that level, you know, we can go ahead and ensure that the content is being, you know, the product itself is being accessible. Um, there um, and we'll share it later, you know, accessibility is a part of the Oscar rubric. Um, so we have been working with, with Dan um, and you know, also within SUNY compliance to, to see what we can do and, and how we can all work together uh, to support campuses. So um, you know, this doesn't end here. This started with you know, FAC2 um, as a task group. And I have you know, said, um, funny part is I said in my um, performance program, I said, I'm just gonna take a break on accessibility for right now and focus on some other things. And here I still stand because it just, it's always something that we need to do. Um, it's something that, that is so intricate in what we do every day. Um, and so it's going to remain on my performance program for, um, for, for a while um, because it's just part of what we do. So um, I think it's a lot on the campus level, but I think SUNY is, is aware of what's going on um, and they're definitely willing to support us um, to see how we can move forward with all of these initiatives. So um, I think it's on everybody's radar. I guess I am, it doesn't matter. We ha um, th this is kind of how our team works. We just all kind of do it. Um, so just in regards to, we really want to know how, you know, how your campus is complying. Because I think, you know, tips as though how Robin has shared with us about things that TOPE has um, to help you. But in regards to compliance, you know, 
we are t training our faculty and we'll show you the website of step-by-step -step directions and checklists and Empire State has a checklist to ensure that you know when you're looking at a course or faculty are working through they know how to do this um, so that images are alt tagged you can share that with the faculty when they go I don't know what that means oh now I understand well how do I do it so there's a multi-step you know process uh, to make sure that they know what needs to be done and then they know how to complete that task um, in order for it to be done. So, you know, it's the providing of the workshops. Um, you know, in regards to the closed caption, I've kind of shared that already with you. Um, you know, but it's, it's really, it's a full campus effort. Sumana from Disability Services is very visible on our campus and working with faculty. Um, so it's, you know, go back to your campus, talk to your Disability Services Center or, or, or whatever, equity and diversity, whatever office that is. Um, and just really ask them to support. You know, one of the things that people will say is, well, we don't have a Sumana on our campus. Um, you know, Sumana is from Disability Services, but she also understands the technology, those assistive and adaptive technologies that our student has. So, um, so that's one of the things that we're really trying to, to work on um, on other projects is to make sure that we have those adaptive and assistive technologies that instructional designers can use to test a course. What is, I don't know what a screen reader is going to do inside of this course. How do I actually, you know, use a screen reader to ensure that it is accessible from a screen reader? So there's, you know, other things that we're, we're beginning to talk about, um, you know, within SUNY on, on how we actually do that. All right. To campus challenges. And I think we've already talked about some of the challenges. Um, I would say, um, from our experience, at, at least at Buffalo State, um, there are kind of, the greatest challenge is a lack of knowledge, and it's a lack of knowledge about the laws and the responsibilities and who's responsible. There's a lack of technical knowledge of how to, you know, so now you know you need to make things accessible, but I have no idea how to make things accessible. And then I, there's also a lack of knowledge about the barriers that students face on an everyday um, basis. For example, um, you know, a lot of, um, Pretty much all of us know that videos need to be captioned, but do we know that our course and everything in our course needs to be, um, nav needs to be keyboard navigable? Um, a lot of people don't know that, and that can be you know, a challenge for many, for many students with disabilities. Um, and as an instructor, as a faculty member, I don't really even know what that means or how to even, where to begin. Um, also, you know, we're getting to the point where faculty members realize that you know the Word documents and PowerPoints and videos need to be accessible, but maybe they don't realize that if they're choo when they're choosing a textbook that the e-text needs to be accessible, that it needs to have alt tags on the images and the um, photos, that the if there if the publisher has videos that those need to be captioned. A lot of um, faculty members are using publisher content like interactive content like my labs and things like that. That all needs to be accessible and you know it's it's really kind of daunting you know when you when you're a faculty member or someone designing a course to think about all of the different things that could cause barriers um, another thing that's happened you know just recently when we were working on our MOOC is that um, we, as we're watching the videos we're realizing that um, they built them with like quotes you know like so the the video opens with a quote um, we have the videos captioned but if someone can't see and they're just listening to the video, they're not going to be, they have, what's on the, the quote on the slide isn't in the captions. Um, and it's, and it's, not in, it's not being spoken. So students who are just listening are not going to hear that. That happens oft, often, we've noticed, um, a lot of times a video will have someone's name and their title, but they never introduce themselves on the video. So that's missing. Um, and just, it's just awareness and knowing about all the different th things that we need to make accessible, all the, all the things that make things unaccessible. Um, and another challenge, honestly, you know, can be pushed back from faculty members who feel like making things accessible proactively is changing their pedagogy. They, you know, like we've had faculty members, um, like where we said, you know, you have all these audio, audio files in your online course, you really need to have transcripts. And they're like, well, in my face-to-face -face course, I, I talk and I expect students to take notes. So if I'm in my online course giving them a transcript, I'm giving all of those students an advantage over my face-to-face -face students. And like I, you know, they just think that that isn't fair. And they, you know, they, it goes against their pedagogy. They want students paying attention and taking notes. And not, you know, they feel like students maybe won't pay attention if they have the transcript. Or if they put the transcript online, you know, for a face-to-face -face class, students might not even come to class at all. 
So I would say that's the, those are some of our challenges. Yeah, those are great ones. Um, one of our biggest challenges right now is time and training, of course. So training is always a big one. Technology, understanding the technology and how it, how it can help us and what we need to do with it. Um, but I mentioned the time piece because of how we go through our revision process. Every time we go into a course right now, it's like a little surprise. It's like a little present. You don't know what's going to happen when you get in and you really start looking at it. So what we think might be a very small revision turns out to be something very major. So the time that, that the, the course developer, which is a faculty member, that the time that they've devoted to completing that revision may double. And so that's one really, really huge challenge is you really don't know what you're going to see until you really start digging in there. Um, training is another big one for us. You know, we've got a lot of people to get trained. We've gone through our entire instructional design team and made sure they had the training. We have got training now for our course developers. And then we're working on the training now for the teaching faculty because not all of our people who are teaching develop and vice versa. So we have to have two separate trainings for everything. So having just the time to do that is a challenge since you know, mostly uh, my team has been, done, been doing the revision and, and the development piece. So we now are trying to squeeze in the time to create trainings uh, for this. So that's, that's a really large one. Um, I don't know if that might Can you guys hear me? Yes, it does work. All right, so here um, on this slide we have some resources. Uh, the first resource that we have is our FAT2 website. That hopefully is going to come up. All right. Um, so there are, we um, worked on the FAT2 um, task force um, to create this accessibility website that says a resource for anyone uh, and there are a few different tabs one is accessibility matters which talks about some of the laws and why does accessibility matter we also have uh, resources for training there are uh, resources for learning how to make you know different types of content accessible um, we work together with SUNY CPD to do some webinars on accessibility, and so we have the recordings on here. Um, they're about an hour long. Um, they just like go through the process of making these different um, documents, videos accessible. There's also one on universal design for learning. Um, on this tab, um, it ta it's information about um, all the different things that we might be using in our course and how do, how do we make sure that all of our materials are accessible textbook publishers, the different technologies that we ask students to use in our course courses. We have a resources tab um, that has different tools and add-ons that you can use to check for accessibility in your course. I think there's links, I forget which page it's on, to the information about the VPAT. Um, if you want to learn more about that, we have a glossary. Um, and then there are some additional websites. Um, and, and one of them actually is our Buffalo State website. Um, there's some sites from other organizations as well that have information about accessibility. So we try to put um, kind of like all, all you, you know, really need to know or, you know, at least give you a really good start on um, learning about accessibility. Awesome. Go back to the back. Okay. Uh, we also have the Buffalo State Instructional Design website, which um, we worked hard to create for our faculty because they come to trainings and they sit in the lab and they learn how to make their Word document accessible or their PowerPoint accessible, but then they get back to their office and they start and they're, you know, they have questions, they forget how to do something. So we try to provide a resource that they can go back to um, and use for support. So this is our website. And there are different tabs over here. So this one is audio and video. Um, so we try when we can to have step-by-step like -step text directions and in some cases we also have some video directions so like for instance for Microsoft Office you know the, this is basically our checklist and actually the, there's a link to the PDF checklist at the top right here that people can print and then these are all the things that are on our checklist and we have you know text directions and when we can when we could find them when we could find accessible video directions uh, we put a link to that too so again it's kind of like a self-help for our faculty members. 
We also um, have a link on our slide to the new um, accessibility portion of the Oscar rubric, which I don't know if I should <laughs> click on this or not. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to ruin anything. <laughs> but I, I'm pretty impressed by it. Um, so if you if you scroll down. Um, so now there's new um, there's a new accessibility tab um, that goes through. This is you know I think will be very very helpful for for us and for faculty members who are developing content. Um, so you have that as a resource, and I'll let Kathleen talk about oops, the last. So the link to our rubric is actually in the, the bit.ly link because our website is undergoing a redesign right now. So I don't have actual website space. What I do have, and um, it's, it will be updated soon, is we do have a blog that my team uses. And so as we uh, get some things ready, I, we will put it a post on the blog. So we've concluded this here so you can refer to it later on. I'm hoping uh, we're, we actually are in the process of doing something very similar to what Buffalo State has. We have a couple of videos we're, we're working on right now, and we, we have uh, um, some other trainings that we are in the middle of developing. So as soon as those are ready, we're going to post it on our blog so everybody can have those as well. And then hopefully, once the website redesign is completed, we will have web space to be able to share all of this. The last, the last thing that we have um, as a resource for you is the bit.ly, which is a folder. It's a Google Drive folder that has um, can't talk and just can't. <laughs> um, so in the folder, there's this presentation so that you'll have, you'll have the links that are in the presentation. We also have some articles um, about recent lawsuits and um, the Empire State Accessibility Rubric is in there. Is anything else? No. So there you go. Um, so if you I'll go back to the slides so that if you want to write down the bit.ly or take a picture of it, which is what we do because it's easier than writing. <laughs> um, you can have all of those resources and I'm sure any of us would be more than happy to answer any questions now or if you want to email us in the future. So I think we have just a, a couple minutes. That's where we, try, we tried to take some questions as we, as we went through. Um, but you know, we're, we're trying you know, at each of our individual campuses and I know um, that many of you are also trying but it's, it's really the, you know, the how do we actually get it um, get it working. So, um, you know, we'll take any questions. Um, the resources are all in the bit.ly. Um, you know, they're out there for you. We have, you know, recordings from CPD. We know that Robin's Tope Group has those resources, um, you know, also on her website. So, you know, there's a lot out there. It's just figuring out, you know, how are you going to use those resources and what process are you going to take on your individual campuses to work with, you know, your business units and, and the way that you work through. So we'll, I guess we have, you know, minute or two for questions if there's any final things before we need to move on. Did your um, um, Blackboard migration help with the, when you had to get the faculty to make their courses um, be beautiful in Blackboard? Did you make them be ADA? I think we had that plan originally and we really wanted to. Um, but everything else that was happening within migration, um, you know, I know that, you know, as Dan came out to do the training, you know, he would throw little, little things in there. Um, you know, one of the nice things that was different from Angel to Blackboard is that when you upload an image, it's asking you to alt tag, and then if you click no, it says, are you sure? It, and then it kind of gives you that. So the, technolo the change of technology, you know, kind of worked um, in our favor and things like that. Um, if you can work that into your migration and your training, I say go for it, but there were so many other things that were happening um, during that time. I know we initially had felt that that was going to be what we were going to do, and I think we, we did some of it. Um, we had the conversations, but to go ahead and say that as content moved from Angel to Blackboard and everything is accessible, um, unfortunately I can't say that. <laughs> Any other questions? Where are you, Ellen? Thank you. I was just looking at some of the resources. So I know they're, they're sort of split. Is there anywhere that there's one central, here's your course, you need to check audio, video, PDFs, Word, everything on one to maybe build a checklist like that for faculty? If you go to the FACT2 website 
and I think it says course materials. Um, so under verify accessibility, course materials, and then it's broken out audio simulations. Um, there it was like Microsoft like Office PDF and web page because a lot of those are the same. Um, the, the way that Buffalo State's website goes in regards to PowerPoint, Word, and things like that, that was the process that we took. We thought if everybody could start with their syllabus, let's make that. And so that was Buffalo State's process. So that's why our site kind of looks that way because that was our goal. Let's start with any Word, let's start with the syllabus and any Word documents. Now let's go to PowerPoints, those two things that we know, and then it was video because that's the way that we felt that our faculty would be able to respond and easily begin working on making their content accessible. Anything else? Yep. Yep, so we took, yep, each semester. We had, they started on their Word documents, and then it was PowerPoint, and then it was audio video. Um, one of the things that I know didn't come out, I knew we had meant to talk, um, mention it just within conversation. Um, what we also did from our Dean's Council was that they pulled um, one person from each department that was an accessibility resource person, and they were responsible for coming to the trainings that we provided, and then we had somebody within the department on the ground um, that could go ahead and help them or direct them to myself, Ginger, or Sumana. All right, well, we are around, um, so if you have questions, comments, concerns, struggles, let us know. <laughs>